Well, I sure do have a video for you today. So, many people think that the Sepulchre nerfs are getting out of hand. They don't like seeing the goalposts move with each nerf. But yet, we all know the Blizzard must have a reason to do this, right? They must be doing this for some reason. Well, we have done a lot of data digging. We've got a pretty impressive set of sheets. We have now got the numbers. So that means it is time to learn why, even though it has made people angry, Sepulchre became the most nerfed raid in World of Warcraft's long history. What's even more is they actually then announced even more nerfs after we started the video. Uh, it was targeted at getting the number of cutting edge kills up before the end of season three. It's wild stuff, so strap in. Numbers first, explanation second. Rating, especially mythic, is about smart use of time. It's about optimizing for the best returns. And it's no wonder that people who play MMOs like WoW with its auction house or EVE end up getting into stocks, which of course have gone a bit down as of late. Now we all know that diversification is the key to long-term investing results and a new platform, today's sponsor, called Masterworks, is changing up that investing game by allowing you to invest in blue chip art. Picasso, Banksy, Warhol, Monet. The sorts of things that are normally only accessible to the ultra elite, who of course make bank by diversifying into art, taking advantage of it as a hedge against inflation and how it does not correlate to stocks as much, making it awesome for diversification. Now, art has outperformed the S&P 500, that's the 500 largest US stocks, by 164% over the last 26 years. So what happens is Masterworks, they extensively research and purchase the art, they securitize each piece with the SEC, and that allows members to buy and sell shares of that art. You make profit once the paintings sell at auction, and so far they've sold four paintings since 2017, netting over 25% annual rate of return to investors. Of course, past performance is no guarantee of future results. I mean, legally I've got to say that, it's also just true, and you should take that with any form of investing. Now, of course, though, with historical advantages and the benefits of diversification, demand has been very high for their platform, especially after their recent painting exit, so there's a wait list. But our viewers can get priority access by going to masterworks.art forward slash bellular or simply clicking the link down below. So check them out. It could be an opportunity of interest to you. Okay, now we've paid the bills. Let's talk about our first three months in numbers. They tell a clear but not complete story. So Nathria had 10,632 first boss kills and 422 final boss kills. For Sanctum, that's 7,510 uh, dead Taragus and 643 dead Sylvanuses. Now, the Jailer may indeed be the uber hard cool dude bro that the story thinks he is because Mythic Sepulchre had just 3,808 first boss kills, and a mere 177 final boss kills. Damn, now obviously there is the, you know, initial like first sort of week availability stuff, um, you know, with the Jailer, but I think across three months that doesn't matter too much. Now, that number is under half of Nathria. It's 3.6-ish times less than the Sanctum final boss kills. That tells a story, doesn't it? That's just wild. And this data set does actually include many, many waves of nerfs. Now this shows us that for whatever reason, fewer mythic guilds are going the distance. If first boss kills are a measure of mythic participation, then to be honest with you, the story is still grim because Sepulchre has half the participation of Sanctum. But wait, it's just really hard. So what's the problem? Well, let's compare some boss uh, sort of kill numbers as the weeks roll on. Uh, now, this, this way we can actually see what the nurse did. And I mean, spoiler, this is big. Here's Holondris, the big raid wiping grab that we all love. The week before, April the 26th slash 7th nerfs, a total of 302 guilds had killed him across all regions. The week after? That number soars to 788, a 160% increase. I mean, does that not tell us all we need to know that these nerfs were indeed impactful? 
Anduin Rin serves as another example then. The week before he was nerfed on the 17th, 18th of May, 380 guilds had defeated him. The week after? That number is 608. By the week before his second big nerf on June 21st, 1077 guilds had killed him. The week after, with the new nerf, that was 1221. So not a whole lot more, but definitely still an increase. Obviously, you would expect increases from week to week, but throughout the whole dataset, we do see a correlation between nerfs and then increases in kills. Though that said, we have seen a more generally diminishing effect with further and further nerfs. So, this all seems a bit spooky, but how does it actually stack up with other raids? Well, one way that we can do that is we can track the percentage of mythic guilds that got the cutting edge achievement within three months. Now, Emerald Nightmare kind of stands out for this one, but that's because Emerald Nightmare ended up being a total cakewalk. What's fascinating though, is how low Nighthold and Tomb of Sargaris are at 1.86% and 1.55% respectively. So how do raids from World of Warcraft's most successful expansion have the lowest number? Well, they were bloody hard, that's why. Nighthole had multiple rock-hard bosses, and Tomb of Sir Garrus was just infamous between Kil'jaeden and Fallen Avatar. So much so that Sepulchre has actually had people speaking of Kil'jaeden and Fallen Avatar again. And when you look at the first boss kills, it does actually seem that participation was actually highest in Uldir, the first raid tier of BFA. A little bit of me wonders if the big popularity of the Race to World First as like a large live stream community event with loads of viewers and sponsors, if it kind of helped to notch up that participation. Just a sort of a wondering thought. Now, you may notice that Emerald Nightmare's first boss kills are pretty low, and then greatly increases for Nighthold, but in more recent times, you can see very clear spikes for the first raids of expansions, um, and then, you know, ones that are, I think, far clearer when we go and we look at the heroic and the normal numbers. Now, when you compare Sepulchre of the First Ones to Nihilotha, it's kind of fascinating, and to be honest, it is a little rough for the game. Remember, the Nihilotha was BFA's fourth raid tier. Sepulchre is only Shadowlands' third, yet 6,111 guilds cleared Rathian in the first three months, while only 3,808 had cleared Sepulchre's first boss within three months. That does look like a decline in mythic participation to me. Jailer vs. Nazoth is also quite funny, 177 Jailer kills in this time frame, 383 Nazoth in this time frame. So no matter what way you cut it, it is clear that Sepulchre of the First Ones has struggled with numbers majorly. I mean, in a big way, this is all rather shocking for the game, and it's clearly the impetus for Blizzard's successive nerfs. And what's shocking to me is that this raid tier was so much more accessible than other ones in the Shadowlands expansion. Covenant restrictions were lifted. Getting four piece was eventually for people guaranteed via the creation catalyst. With all that power and less friction to get characters up to speed, less friction to play alts, how has this raid managed to produce such dismal numbers? Well, time to find out. So Sepulchre has gone down as one of the hardest, if not the hardest, raids uh, in, in, in WoW's history, in addition to being the most nerfed. It has a record number of very difficult mythic bosses with many unforgiving mechanics that had to be nerfed into oblivion to get the average cutting edge guild to clear. And you've got to remember, an average cutting edge mythic raiding guild is, in overall terms, a very high end, very highly skilled guild. So what went wrong then? Why are the bosses like that? Did Blizzard miss their tuning targets? Did they misjudge their own player power systems or their own players? Well, while this graph uh, is a bit rough, it's not very ideal or completely accurate with its scale, I think it does serve to illustrate a point. And that point is that player power was maxed out so early on in the Race to World First guilds that very little power was actually gained later on and those additional power gains later on would gradually nerf the difficulty of raid bosses for everyone else. Okay, why? Well, I have to wonder if it's the tuning requirements of the Race to World First. That's an event where guilds are putting in more and more insane preparation than ever, and I'm going to take you through some of that. 
You see, with split runs, Race to World First guilds are able to accelerate through World of Warcraft's gearing curve at breakneck pace. Even more so nowadays, because these guilds are also large, well-funded social media organizations that have got legions of dedicated fans. And they actually pay those fans World of Warcraft gold to help them with split runs. Um, right? Those fans are then able to trade desirable pieces of loot to the raid team. And the amount of gold spent is just eye-watering. So using just uh, Liquid, who are previously called Limit, and Echo, as examples, we see that Liquid spent 723 million gold on the Sepulchre, while Echo spent 694 million gold. For Sanctum, Liquid spent 279 million, while Echo spent 478 million gold. That's a lot of gold. Almost enough to max out a Diablo Immortal character. Well, not really. This stuff, of course, does fluctuate from tier to tier, but Sepulchre was the most expensive tier, and I think that number is going up. So, the upshot is that these guilds get a huge power spike very early on because split runs let them condense many weeks of loot progress into, like, two or so weeks. Because of this, Blizzard had to tune later Sepulchre of the First Ones bosses to that power level, because if they didn't, the race would just end up being a cakewalk. Now, this meant that Blizzard were tuning those bosses for nearly maxed out gear with both double legendaries and a four piece set bonus. I suppose a part of this is that it would never have been possible to defeat Jailer before the first reset because he literally wasn't available. Now, anyway, this tuning from Blizzard meant that by the time that average cutting edge mythic guilds got to Anduin and beyond, they were actually at the same power level as the Raced World First Raiders and they couldn't really exceed it that much. Something that otherwise has been possible in pretty much every modern raid tier. These average mythic players just weren't able to gradually outgear the bosses, meaning that with that not being possible, Blizzard had to increase clear rates by nerfing these bosses. As they ended up, intentionally or not, tuning bosses not only for incredibly well-geared characters, but also for that and being the best, most well-prepared raiders in the world. Nerfs happen pretty much every tier, but what's different is the extent here. These were not just minor number changes to account for a lack of gradual power uh, acquisition. No. Some mythic mechanics have been flat out removed. Others, while not completely gone, are essentially nerfed to basically not exist when compared to their original state. The sheer amount and frequency of nerfs is unprecedented when compared to previous raid tiers in the World of Warcraft. So clearly then, the scale of the Raced World First is kind of getting away from Blizzard. It makes it extremely hard for Blizzard to actually nail their tuning here. This means nerfs. Those nerfs then cause confusion and discontent, and that trickles down from the mythic raiders to people who watch them to the other difficulties because those with the most skin in the game often set the tone for the conversation, regardless of if that's actually their intent or not. And then that begs the question, what do the leaders of these organizations have to say? So Max leads Liquid, Scripe leads Echo. What do they think? Well, per Max, bosses tend to be tuned to be killable within week one in the race. That means killable without a second week of split runs, mythic gear, and in this case, things like double legendaries. Of course, it's a bit different this raid tier, because for narrative reasons, they split the post Anduin content to be in the next week. Now, this is why there is, you know, the sort of first reset thing. That's why there's always a lot of tension and excitement in the race as it's leading up to the first reset. I'll take some numbers here for you. So Denathrius opened on the 15th of December. He was killed eight days later on the 23rd. Sylvanas Mythic opened up the 13th of July. She died on the 20th. The Sepulchre race started on the 9th, but the final three bosses only unlocked the following week. And that ultimately led to a situation where Zoval ended up being defeated on the 26th, a full 17 days after the race began. That is just more resets of player power that Blizzard had to tune Jailer and his mates for in order to have a good level of challenge for these players who are the most competitive on the planet. 
Plus, as Max points out, the raid was actually just really hard. The bosses required extremely precise positioning, and they had binary pass-fail mechanics that slowed down progression, making it harder for the sorts of guilds who would tend to just limp closer and closer and closer to the finish. Per Scribe, then, what split runs do for gearing is a massive problem, and he thinks that them not being possible would be good for them as mythic raiders, because it would be, you know, they wouldn't have to do it and it sucks, but it would also be good for the casual players, in his view. I would presume that that would be because it would make Blizzard's balance job a bit less mad. And that would be sort of good for all the players. But because bigger guilds, big guilds are the only ones who have got the logistics to actually do split runs in this way and pay millions of gold to trade loot. It's one of those things where, yeah, there might be more. It's a bit like the tax code. The more complex it gets, the more it favors people with lots of money who can afford a good accountant. Now, Scribe also talked about removing barriers, and for him that means things like removing covenant requirements for soul binds, the creation catalyst being there on day one, the game being more all friendly, which thankfully they're doing for the next expansion, uh, and reducing the impact of split runs. Also for him, reducing the need for add-ons by tweaking fight implementation, and uh, then just like less odd things like people feeling they've got to farm Sylvanas daggers. So that all makes sense to me. And one thing I kind of keep on noticing is a lot of the things that, say, Scripe would say that, you know, in a way are going to be good for the race to world first and that kind of sphere of the game, they're generally quite good for the rest of the game too because it mostly involves just making the design of WoW a bit more reasonable. So all this stuff makes sense. Uh, it would help to level the playing field, it would increase the game's playability, and likely result in Blizzard having an easier time balancing their game. And that's good because if the easier, or if balancing is easier, then it can be done with less issues and they can move on to other tasks that are also important. As for me, look, my opinion does not matter here. It just doesn't. The strict 20 player format makes Mythic impossible for my guild. That's just it. The current way Mythic's done will never appeal to me. And that's very much unlike how Warcraft was before something that I think a lot of modern players won't even be aware of these days. And that is that the raid formats were restructured in 2014. You see, back in the day, you used to have 10 and 25, and they had a heroic mode. The heroic mode was equivalent to today's mythic, but because there was a 10 player and a 25 player mode, it would mean that a more casual friends and family guild that's only really fielding like 10 to 12 raiders, they would be able to dip in to the hardest difficulty mode in the game without, you know, changing the format and the social tone of their guild. So that just meant that friends and family guilds once they were done with Heroic, they could actually have some fun just seeing what early Mythic is like. So that's just a gripe that I have, and it's why a lot of this discussion will never apply uh, to me personally. All right, so it's actually been a little while since the rest of this video was recorded. All of our numbers were for the first three months of the raid tier, but of course there have been a few more up-to-date things, so I want to hop in here and give you guys a bit of an update. Right. So these numbers do not change the fact that Sepulchre is the hardest raid basically in history and that it had all-time low participation at every difficulty bracket. Like, that's insane. And to me, it's kind of depressing because honestly, I really enjoyed the raid when I hopped into it. But we want to see how it changed. So how did the nerfs go? That's the big question. Well, as of the week, just before the big and I think most likely the final massive nerf, uh, wave, we did see that the number of guilds that have defeated the Chuckler went up to 453. A month before that point in time, that number was 177. So that's a massive change. And looking through some of the other numbers, we see, you know, Anduin, Lords of Dread, they've almost doubled. Rygalon, two and a half times increase, almost a two and a half times increase. And those are numbers that don't actually reflect the most recent wave of nerfs. Now, for those nerfs, this is kind of funny. So, from the single day, from a single day of the latest and probably final nerf wave being active, 134 guilds defeated uh, Zoval across EU and NA, right? Now, that's kind of crazy as a number because that is actually over 45% more kills than all of the previous week combined in one day. 
big, right? And for the other bosses, they do have uh, day one numbers that basically don't eclipse last week's numbers, but they are all still quite high, which just basically means we're going to see so many kills, at least compared to the trickle that we had seen over the next like three or so weeks in the lead up, of course, to season four. And then when we look at some other bit more up to date numbers, after almost a week, so five to six days since the humongous wave nerf uh, to the Jailer, uh, Jailer kills have actually risen by 58%. Now, the other bosses in total have went, you know, about 5 to 11%, so you can really see it's big for the Jailer. Now, there's still about 661 guilds that we can tell from the data uh, who are actually progressing the last three bosses of the raid. If you include Anduin, that's 1,235 guilds. So really the big question here for Blizzard and these kills is, you know, in the number of raid nights that you're doing in a week, is that going to be enough to actually get the clear and to get those ahead of the curve and cutting edge numbers to be kind of proportionately where Blizzard would actually want them to be? Who knows? Of course, this video can't cover the full consequences of these nerfs because um, we'll know those in three weeks. So who knows? Maybe we'll talk about Sepulchre again. There's a bit of me that's kind of tempted to, you know, to hop in and uh, kind of give you guys a number on the normal heroic, etc. stuff because, I mean, I don't do mythic. I'm not good enough for that. But lots of us do normal and heroic, right? So I wouldn't mind looking at that. We actually do have the numbers. Um, it was just impossible to fit into this video while still doing like a proper analysis of this mythic situation. I think for normal and heroic, maybe there's a few other things at play. It's a fascinating situation though. And certainly this is a situation that Blizzard does not want to repeat with, uh, with Dragonflight. So it's going to be fascinating to see how all that goes. And as an almost final update to this video on the topic of raiding, well, the quote from Ian Hazakostas is, is very frank and refreshing. It is, we give up, you win. I was talking about this whole situation, about the real challenge they have when these top-end mythic guilds can just get so optimized and their players are so good. I think Blizzard have really realized to themselves they need to make this content for the average mythic raiders. And I think that's what's going to be happening in the next expansion now that our game director has, who of course himself comes from an encounter design background now that he's actually very much acknowledged this uh, problem in interviews and in a very frank manner. So it's going to be fascinating to see how raiding will shape up in the Dragonflight expansion. Okay, right, that's it for today. Thank you to today's sponsor, Masterworks. You can see what's up with them down below and get past the waitlist by using my code. And I suppose with that said, thanks for watching. And if you're a Mythic Raider or a normal or heroic Raider, just let me know what has your team's experience been like with this tier? I'd be absolutely fascinated. Okay, see you next time.